Bobbig. We'll continue with uh, Drew Liu and the ringtone player in Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I usually get very hot, so I'm gonna get a bit of show first. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, ringtone player in Elm. Sounds exciting. That's me. My name is Drew. Um, I was born in China, grew up in Italy. I know right now all this coronavirus <laughs> going on like crazy in your hands. Don't worry, I've been living in the UK for the last five years. There's been only like 15 cases, you're safe. Um, okay, so today I'm about to talk about ringtones. I'm not sure if everybody can see it. This is a very recent XKCD comic. So, you know, thank you, Randall. Um, I'll give you a few seconds to read it through. Oh, I should start my timer, anyways. Um, after 150 years, humanity is finally on the verge of winning the war against ringtones. So today we're going to open this time capsule, more or less between 2000 and 2005. So between the cool space beeps, the first ones, and song and novelty ringtones. Um, perfect. Amazing. The ringtone industry. I read this paper, which is called Research in the mobile phone ringtone, towards and beyond the ringtone dialectics. It's very interesting, actually. Um, I don't recommend to any of you, but in 2003, um, ringtone industry was 10% of the total global music industry revenue. It was $3 billion out of $32 billion. The ringtone industry. It's just like so funny. Um, and each ringtone cost 99 to 199, and I, I'm talking about like uh, polyphonic ringtones in this case. But it was really, really great because when the first phones finally supported real songs, you could only buy the real song for 299, but then you could buy the full song on iTunes for 99 cents because Apple had like this special contract. I've learned all this in the in the paper, by the way. So feel free to go and check it out later if you have time. Um, cool, but the, the ugly thing about the truth that the, the deep state doesn't want you to know about the ringtone industry is that you had to buy them, right? Like you could either like pirate them online if you were one of these ar like early pirates, or you had to buy them, and it sucked. And that's how they make so much money out of it. So there was like some phones which. This one is not the first one that allows you to do that, but this is one that I had, so I liked it very much. And it's the Nokia 3310. It was released on the 1st September of year 2000, so exactly at the cusp of uh, random space sounds, as Randall Monroe says. And had this glorious 84 by 48 pixels monochrome display, backlit. And it sold 100 million units, which is pretty good. And it's very well known, there's like many memes online because how sturdy it was as a phone, right? So this talk is not serious, so yeah. Fixes it. Okay. Of course, oh, it works. I mean, there's no it doubt works, about the fact how? it works. Guys, <laughs> anyways, whatever. It's in Russia. <laughs> I mean, this is the hydraulic press, guys. <laughs> Let's see how the Nokia 3310. <laughs> Look at the, this glorious replay. You can see like this. Molecules and atoms just being crushed. <laughs> it's, it's a <laughs> <laughs> and his Press glory is like English accents. Maybe we could try one more time. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, so, apart from being very sturdy, you had this glorious uh, monophonic ringtone composer. So, you could just open the phone, there was a section with like tones, and there was like this section called composer. And you had to use this weirdly, really weird and awful way to 
uh, basically encode the ringtone into your phone. But once you, you know, did it like 20, 30 times, you, this was basically like another version of T9 for putting like <laughs> ringtones. And then you could, you know, stick it to the man. And instead of buying uh, ringtones for 99 cents, you could just, you know, download this TXT on the internet and just, you know, amaze your friends with your hacking skills. And even the monophonic sound was like so good, like when you listen to it, it's like so iconic, right? And of course, you know, like classical musicians love it when this happens. So this is how classical musicians tell you to fuck off, basically. Um, and there, you know, at the time there were like jail cities and everything, but even today you can click on nokia.nigelcaldwell.co.uk tunes.html and you are greeted with this amazing page. I love everything about it, the color scheme to start. <laughs> then at first it says, to search page, Press Control F. Like, how awesome is that? Like, where do you get this sort of like usability in modern websites? <laughs> then you scroll to the bottom. It has the version. I was like, oh my god, look at that, 1.032. If you can't see it from the back. Uh, anyways, and then you get these amazing ringtones. So like here we have uh, Abba, Mamma Mia, everybody's favorite song, and these are the notes. Uh, and I will tell you more about what these things mean, and we can see also it has a tempo, right? And basically this tells you how fast the song is going to be. So I'm afraid that uh, that's the end of my slides. So we're going to do some live coding today, so let's see how that goes. Um, I'm going to create a main Elm file. I'm going to I've set up some snippets inspired from the Harry Potter universe. So it's Acho Elm, it will grab me an Elm file. And then I've set up some, oh no, I already had the right one, that's fine. Elm Live, and it's just like to set up some, oh no, I didn't save it. Just give me a sec, this is like normal maintenance routine. Um, and this setup is like some auto-loading so that we, that we don't have to kill the server, or whatever. And here, if I go to localhost uh, 8000, you'll see, ta-da, hello world. Awesome. Um, so I know like this is a pretty like functional oriented crowd. So what I'm curious with is, is anybody not a functional programming you know person? Like who has never written a type signature? Come on. <laughs> very good, very good. So the talk, like this talk is for you too. The other people, I don't really care. Like you know, they they're already zealots. Like it's like selling water to the thirsty is pointless. But like who has never tried type signatures or functional programming in general? I, I think that's like you know like where the true power of this thing is, right? So you've never seen this. This is Elm. It's this functional language. It's pure. Uh, I think someone called it extreme. I think that's beautiful. Like I love extreme stuff. You know, like Mad Max and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, this is a main program. It imports some libraries. Uh, we have in Elm this way of building apps, which is called Model View Update. And right now you can see the model is just empty, there's nothing in it. And then we have a view function that takes a model, and this arrow means, no, what returns or something. And you return some HTML, you can see there's a div, some text, hello world, right? Like this is pretty simple. So for example now, if I was to change uh, this to BobConf, and I save this, you'll see that it will recompile and it will change it like in real time, yeah? And the, then the last step is this update function, which is basically how you react to changes in the world. So for example, uh, if a user clicks a button, you receive this message, you get the current model, and you do something new. It's basically like the Redux pattern or whatever if you're you know, uh, doing some JavaScript. So um, we don't have to worry too much about all this stuff. This is just like setup stuff, so I don't really care. So if you know Latin, you know like what this means. Um, this is how the Romans um, indicated that like below a certain line in Africa there were just lions and you don't need to care about that. We're going to care about our stuff.
Um, and we're going to keep uttering stuff from our magic little thingy. And you'll see that now if I save, something magical will happen again. Like, something weird, like all my code got like shifted around and you're like, ugh, that's awful. No, it's amazing. Because basically I don't have to worry about what I'm typing. Like usually when you're programming, you always have to uh, you know, be afraid I'm going to add a space and the compiler isn't going to like. No, I'm just going to type crap in it, like garbage in, code out. That's how I think about code. Um, so we get this ringtone, right? Like, and as, as I said, like, these are notes. So the first one is 4C2. It means something that's a quarter of a note. The note is C in the second octave. Unfortunately, it's not really the second octave as musicians would call it. Like, that's the Nokia second octave. This actually, in reality, would be the fourth octave. Like, that's an, a C4 in reality. But, you know, nobody cares about that, really. Um, and then we have uh, a quarter of a D note, a quarter of a knee note, and then we have 16 dash, which means this is a pause in your ringtone, and it lasts a sixteenth of a note. And then the last thing is like a bit weird. It's like 8 dot sharp 8. That looks nothing like, you know, like music. It looks like a regular expression or something. And eight dot means this is a dot note. So it's supposed to be an eighth of a note, but when there's a dot, you multiply that duration by 1.5. We're programmers, so we can multiply by 1.5. So this means like we have an, an eighth plus 16. So it's like a slightly longer note than usual. Sharp A, of course, means A sharp. And three <laughs> is the octave. Uh, so this is the format that you were you're, you're supposed to put in in your phone, right? And what we're going to do today is going to do something which I call um, wishful programming. So I don't have anything, but I wish I had. And then you start thinking, well, what's the right thing that you should have? And you create like these nice descriptions of these data structures. And once you've done that, basically the hard part has been done. You just need to fit in the real ugly world into your nice and beautiful types. I think it also helps you, like you know, with your normal life. You know, if you have things that trouble you, just turn them into Elden types. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do that. So I'm going to create a tone, and the tone you can see, like our ringtone, is a list of tones, right? So we can say that the tone is either a sound, or it can be a pause. And as I said before, garbage in, code out. But uh, right now you can see that this sound and this pause, they they're just names. I don't have a way to attach more information. So like, for example, all these nodes and pauses, they have different durations. So I have to incorporate that information inside the type. Right? So I'm just going to do uh, duration. Same here, duration. I don't want to type it down, so I'm going to cheat. Match duration. I say this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and you can see like now like we're, we were able to incorporate this extra little bit of information. We can say that our things have a duration and that's what the duration is. I don't think I need to explain this, but if anybody has doubts at any point, interrupt me. I don't really care about you know, finishing the talk. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, is Matthias here? No, uh, because he was my reviewer and I promised him and I promised him that I would have practiced the talk. I didn't. I'm sorry, Matthias. But we'll do what we can. Um, <laughs> so, duration, right? Like, we're very happy about this, but then we notice, oh, wait, we have these dotted notes, right? 1.5, and they're not represented there. So, instead of crying, we're just going to change this to a duration length, and then we're going to add a new type, which we'll call duration. And this thing can either be a normal thing with a duration length, or it can be a dotted <coughs> duration length. I think that that's like the problem, like when you're working with types for the first time, like this doesn't feel like programming, right? Like normally when you're programming, you're you know, checking how the Rails API for doing something is, or the Scala API or something. But usually when you're writing types, like you are literally God. You can decide whatever you want. That feels good. Um, so I, I saved this, right? And I, another thing that I want to show you is like, what if I make a mistake? Like, what would happen in JavaScript, right? Like, you make a mistake, it happens, because I have fat fingers. Um, and you see that uh, right now, like, the compiler will immediately tell me that something is not right. It says, uh, I cannot find a duration length type, dotted duration length. These names seem close, though. Okay? And it tells me that probably I meant that version with the final H. 
And then it gives you a helpful link to understand how, maybe you made a mistake, you made a typo or something, but the compiler will, you know, always have your back. It's basically like the friend you never had. <laughs> um, all right, so we have this sound, we have this duration, and we notice something else, right? Like we have this sound, it has a duration, but actually in the real world, there's also like a pitch, like this thing makes a sound, and what sound is it? It is it's like C2, right? So we need to encapsulate this information inside the type, so I'm going to call it pitch. I'm going to say that uh, pitch is a pitch. It's, this is a bit weird because you're seeing pitch both sides. Like actually, the, the first one is the, the type, and this is one is like the data constructor. It's weird, like I'm sorry, but this is how things are. And uh, the pitch has a note and an octave. And of course, like none of these things exist. That's why I said before that it's like wishful programming. Like you just hope that the world is not as bad as you think it is. And then you have to utter stuff. That's the only solution <laughs> that I've found so far. And then you can say that octave, right now we don't care that, like it shouldn't be like a, too much of a complicated type. I'm just going to say it's going to be an alias to an int. So right now in this pitch information, we have pretty much everything that we need. And we see it compiles, it means it works. So uh, unfortunately, uh, right now I have like this browser open, right? Like you, you can imagine like you're writing JavaScript and you have like this full editor and then you switch to the browser and nothing works. So normally like that step here is caught here, right? Like in the, if I have like the full screen editor and I save, there's, oh, there's a problem. What's the problem is I cannot find the model. Okay, I can fix it, right? Um, I don't know what, what it broke, oh yeah, this, whatever. Uh, let me just go back to my view. Um, okay, so right now we have described like the world that we want to, you know, this problem that we want to solve with these beautiful types. But the problem is actually, as I said, the real world looks like that, right? So we have to have a function that takes this string and turns it into something beautiful. And that thing is a parser. Uh, and the parser is nice because it will exactly return these tones, right? If you are using a regular expression, a regular, a regular expression is only good at understanding, first of all, where is some text? And then if it's really powerful, it can probably return you some bits of text and tell you, oh, I think that there's a note there. I think there's a duration. And then you have to write some handwritten code to parse that thing, to understand that the D is actually a D note. But here, you're God. So you just say, this is a D. And the parser said, okay, whatever, it's a D. So we're going to use um, a library which is called Elm Parser. So I'm just going to import it. And for like, presentational purposes, I'm just to expose all the functions. You should never, ever, ever do that. Do that. Um, and we want to write a parser. Okay, so let's write the, you know, the dumbest parser we can think of. And the dumbest parser, I'm just going to call it a ringtone parser and it's going to be a parser of a um, list of tones, right? And I think this is like a bit weird, like uh, up until I was talking about these things, uh, you could say, okay, like that's fine, but why is a parser a parser of a list of tones? I if you think about it, you actually want a function, takes a string and returns some other stuff. So actually, that parser is, ex is exactly that. It's, sorry, it's just a nicer way to write that down. And we're going to write a very um, simple parser, which is the parser that always returns the same value. So I'm going to return a list, and I'm going to say, you're going to return a sound, it's going to have a pitch, it's going to be A4. And uh, I'm going to say that it's going to have a normal duration of a whole note, yeah? And this thing compiles, it works. Um, in the view function, instead of printing hello Bob Conf, I'm going to replace this, I'm going to say, uh, run this parser, so I'm going to say, parser run, I'm going to pass this parser we've just written, and pass our ringtone, right, uh, here. And this thing is a case, like it's a switch expression, right, and this thing, this run will return two possible values, right. It can either, everything was okay, you were able to parse uh, your uh, ringtone, or something went bad. So when everything's okay, you're just okay, you know, nothing special about that. I'm just going to create span and debug uh, the value. Otherwise, if something got horribly wrong, uh, I'm just going to do the same because I don't really care. Um, and here I'm just going to debug the error, right? <coughs> Save, compile, it works. Uh, sound, pitch A4, normal whole. And you, at this point, well, you're cheating, like you're creating a parser which is completely useless. 
that is true, I will admit that. Uh, but I think it's very useful, like when you're working with types, to verify that your whole program is sort of connected properly, that like, like all your basic assumptions about the world are there. And right now we've just done that. Like even though it's not per se useful, we've verified that all the glue code that goes through the program, all my special types and emits some HTML, that part is good. So now I can focus on the real problem I want to solve. Um, I'm not actually going to do that because that would take me too much time. So you just have to trust me on this. Um, but, you know, just because I don't want to, you know, pretend to do a talk and not do anything really, I'm going to write a, a small parser. So instead of like the whole list of tones, I'm just going to write a single parser for a tone, right? And I'm going to remove this parser prefix because now you already know what succeed means, right? And I'm going to say the succeed, instead of returning this simple value, it can also accept a function. So in this case, if I parse uh, my, um, where is it? My, my little thing, I see like, first I will have to parse this thing, which is the duration, and then I will parse the, the note with the pitch with the octave, right? Um, so in right now, in this tone parser, I can imagine that there will be some piece of code that parses this duration and returns it to me, uh, and then another thing that pitches the pitch, and then from with that thing, I can actually create my pitch. I can say that, uh, no, this is not the duration. Oh, was that good? Yeah, that was good, sorry. Pitch, pitch, and duration. Cool. Um, so, and this is another beautiful thing about parsers. Like, parsers are very easy to combine. Like, once you've gotten this little bit of logic that's able to consume strings and return nice types, it's very easy to combine them. Like, if you try to combine regular expressions, good luck with that. So the way with this Elm parser library that you combine parsers is using this weird operator, which is the uh, commonly known as the left Hadouken op operator. Um, and we're just going to pass a duration parser to it. And then we're going to pass also a pitch parser. And if I save this, Elm will complain, say, like, you, you just saw, like, what are these? Probably you mean something else. No, I just don't have it, I'm dumb. That's usually how it goes when you're programming in Elm. Um, so let's say we have uh, this duration parser. I'm just going to write it like real simply. If you think about the duration, right, this thing can be a whole, a half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth. There's like a lot of stuff that could happen. And uh, instead, right now, I I don't know. Like so, like there's this constructor which is called one off, which allows you to pass a list of parsers, and it will just try them and see what works and what doesn't. So, for example, in this case for the duration, I can say succeed and return a whole thing when I get a symbol which is uh, one, right? And then I can copy this little thing, thank you, copy, paste, uh, and half, and text this, or two. Cool, so if I save this, the first error will go away and Elm will complain, oh, I don't know what the pitch parser is. Okay, fine, so I'm going to say that the pitch parser is something that parses a pitch, so just as before, I'm going to say, you're going to get a note <coughs> and an octave, right? Note, octave and you can construct a pitch using that node and that octave. Um, and here, basically, I'm going to say there's going to be a node parser, just as before. Like, and you know, like if you ever heard about parser combinators, like that's actually what, what they are. You know, like there's nothing magical about them. You're just combining functions. And I'm going to copy this over, and I'm going to say whenever you see um, one, I'm actually going to return four, because like, that's the actual like, musical notation of the note. Um, and I'm going to copy that, copy that, um, five, uh, this is going to be two, this is going to be six, and this is going to be three. Uh, I think I missed this. Um, no swap file. Thank you. Note parser. There's no such thing as note parser. Okay. That's a bit boring, so I'm just going to utter it. And you can see it, like, there's just all the notes um, and stuff like that. Um, Cool, so node parser, duration parser, and now this thing is breaking because, uh, oh, I, I, because I said, I wrote that this was going to be a tone parser, right, a parser of tone. But if you look at the return value, I'm returning a pitch. So Elm is telling me, look, the body is a parser pitch, but you said that you wanted a parser of a tone, so there must be a mistake there, right? And as you can see, like, if your code is broken and you just won't compile, you don't have to you know, open the JavaScript inspector to understand like, what's going on. So actually here I wanted the sound, and that's the bug. 
And the duration parser, um, there's another bug. Apparently, you can't write code. And it says, you pass me something that has a duration length, but I wanted a duration because I forgot to add that this should be normal. I forgot. I mean, clearly, I just did it for presentational purposes. Um, and you can see that now this thing works. Um, well, it doesn't really, right? Because in the body of the function, we're still using this ringtone parser. So if I use the tone parser instead, and I pass a note, like um, 4A2, 3, I think. Uh, now it crashed. I don't know why. Maybe I, I don't know. Tone parser. Can someone help me debug what the problem is? You don't have five quarter notes. A quarter notes? Yeah, you have whole and half notes. Oh, no. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, see, that's the problem. But it's much better when I'm, you know, doing it on stage and when I'm alone. Because when I'm alone, I'm just, oh, I don't know. And I give up. <laughs> so if I grab, like, the real uh, duration parser, you can see that this thing worked. It's, that it's a quarter. It's a normal duration. And the pitch is A6, right? So if I were to change that to something else, I could say that this is, like, 8. And it's a uh, dot note sharp, right? And the parser will say, okay, it's B flat, which is the same as A sharp, well, sort of, um, and adopted eighth of a note. So, like, this is the proof that it works. Um, sort of. How much time do I have left? Uh, 13 minutes. 13? 13. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Um, so, I don't want to bore you with more uh, details, so I'm going to show you something else that you have built, which is based on that. It's called nice. Um, so if I look at this nice thing and I start Elm Live just in the same way, you'll see, ooh, what is that? So I've built like I've just added some CSS. So you can tell like you know like when you're at a functional programming conference because the moment you add some CSS, you can hear like some people are really excited. Um, and it's the same program under the hood. There's like not much different. I've, I will put all the source online, so it's already online. Actually. <coughs> so you will see like most of it. It's the same program. I've just used this little library which I've written, which does the same thing. Like, but basically you can see like in the in the core of the of the thing, I'm just doing parse composer. I'm using the model user input just as we were doing before. And when it's okay, I'm going to do something. And when it's an error, I'm going to say, oh, I couldn't part the ring ringtone. So for example, if I start writing uh, like Dobby here and I oh no, no I don't know oh uh, maybe I'm not showing the alert message any longer oh no maybe it's here anyway trust me it works um, so uh, the problem I think we were mentioning before that like Elm is this pure language right so uh, in this case we want to interact with the web audio API so we need to perform side effects we need to interact with JavaScript so I just wanted to show that it's not as hard as it sounds. Like normally, you, we have these mechanisms called ports, where the Elm program can communicate with the other side of the world. And I'm just going to say that this uh, module is a port module, and we're going to have a port function which is called play. And this play is going to send some JSON encoded value, and it's going to return the side effect. And basically, then when whenever a user presses play, I can do stuff. So for example, here, instead of saying, don't do anything, I'm saying, OK, if you were able to parse this thing, then actually just um, encode it to a JSON value and play it. So I'm just going to say encode. No, I can't type value. Cool. And then on the JavaScript side, I will receive this thing. So um, index.js. So you can see here, I can just do app, port, play, subscribe subscribe and this is a function that gets some data whenever it's sent uh, down the um, hole and here I can just do console log uh, this is JavaScript here there you go and if I open the inspector refresh it play you can see that it works uh, like that encode function took the really nice beautiful Elm types and just converted it to these simple objects I'm sure you can't see them oh too much no. Uh, well, enough. Right. So basically, it's just saying, okay, that node was this frequency and was like this duration in seconds. So it just like did this uh, little encoding um, for us. And this is pretty cool, but uh, it's not making any sounds. So what I want to do today is like also show 
this part of um, the web APIs, which is called Web Audio API. It's very simple, but very complicated. So everything revolves around this idea of a context. So every time you have to create an audio context. And after you created this context, the context is like basically what controls the whole audio signal. If you read the spec, it says like the audio context is this thing, lets you have this modular routing of sounds, whatever. It's like a lot of crap. Um, but basically, you just want to have some nodes, and these nodes have some inputs and some outputs. So what we're going to do right now is to create an oscillator, and this is just like a name for a synthesizer, and we're going to say um, context.create oscillator. Yeah? And then we're, very important, like when I was trying the presentation, like every time I forget to connect it to the output, so I don't hear any sounds, and then I get mad. But in, if you want to hear stuff, you have to connect it to a destination. And then you can say oscillator start, and then you can say oscillator um, stop, and I, maybe I can just put two. Uh, if now the code doesn't work, that's JavaScript's fault. Like it's not my fault. I did my best. <laughs> Too much, but that worked. Okay. So we created the audio context. We created this oscillator, which creates the sine wave. If you want to know more about sound waves and what is this thing that we call sound, come, to, come and talk to me later. Uh, we have connected to the destination, we say start to start the thing, and we say stop to stop it after two seconds. In reality, the Web Audio API also tracks, has this very precise tracking of time. So for example, we can say uh, it has like this variable inside the context, which is called current time, uh, if I can type it properly, current time. And for example, here you could say now and now plus two to say, but it does exactly the same thing. I'm just gonna play it a bit less louder because it just burned my ears. Cool, um, so this worked, um, amazing. So another thing I want to show you is like, right now you have, you can imagine there's like this generator of waveforms and then you have this output. But since it's a modular audio routing graph, you can insert stuff in the middle. So you can say, I can create a filter, and you can say that this is a contest, I'm going to create a by quad filter. You don't need to worry about what that thing is. We're going to say it's the type of this filter is a high pass, so it's just going to let some high frequencies uh, up. And then I'm going to say that uh, the value um, of this thing is going to be um, set target at time. Um, let's put it like real high. We're going to, oh, let me just move this now here. Okay, cool. And just after one second, it's going to start. It's going to last one second. So if I refresh this thing now, oh, uh, see, I broke. I probably broke some JavaScript, and I don't know what happened. So cannot <coughs> so set. Uh, sorry. Semicolon. Uh, I don't think so. It's like saying like cannot set. No. Maybe it's not, oh no, I know what it is. So it's like frequency, of course. But that's what happens, you know, like when you write code. Um, I think this worked, awesome. Um, <coughs> did it work? No, because I didn't connect it. I just created it and threw it into the wilderness. So instead, what I have to do is to connect all these nodes together. I can say that the oscillator connects connect to the filter, and then the filter connects to the destination, yeah? And if I refresh now, you can see like after a bit, that thing like went down, it just went beep, and um, I can do the same thing again. For example, I can make the sound like a bit longer, and I can say that in uh, two seconds, it's going to get high again, but it's going to you know do it like slowly with this like envelope effect. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And okay, so I think now we have like the basic knowledge of how the Web Audio API works. Um, there are some really nice Chrome extensions which let lets you see like more stuff. So for example, you could be able to see something like this. Um, you can see like we have these are oscillators. This is the bipod filter. That's the audio destination. So there's some like really nice tooling out there too play around with this stuff and visualize it, especially when you have like a more complicated setup, it's very important. 
Um, cool. So the last thing I'm going to do is just to actually play the tune, right? Like otherwise, you know, it's just cheating. So uh, what I'm going to do is here I'm going to write some JavaScript again. I'm going to say I get some data. I'm going to reduce it. And this function takes an accumulator and the current element. And then here, I think I basically do the same thing. Maybe I can just get rid of this. Now, I don't need the filter. I can just say oscillator connect context destination. I guess I need to make, I mean, I think it's right, more or less. Let's see. And uh, I can maybe I can just call uh, ACK here. And I can say, instead of stopping, I have a duration, right? Like we had this LM dot duration. And then the reducer, uh, it needs to return something. So I can just return uh, ACK plus mm, LM duration. And I think the, uh, the last thing that I'm forgetting is like I need to set um, the frequency of the oscillator. So I can just say oscillator frequency dot value equal LM dot, I don't remember what it was. I think it was frequency. <coughs> Let's see, let it explode, who cares? Um, Always have to program with the thing, right? Um, before I get uh, forcibly removed from the stage, um, when you can set also sine waves, so this is oscillator. So you can say oscillator type sine, oscillator type sawtooth, so they're, they're different shapes, right? So what I thought I could have done is to buy an original Nokia 3310. This is my Steve Jobs moment. So uh, I, I got this, which is great, great phone, especially if you have to go to the United States of America. Um, and you can play a sound on this oscillator, and then you can sample it, right? And then you can grab, do some like Fourier transforms on this stuff. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but I'm just going to acho this wave. And you can see, this is the representation of the original synthesizer in this time domain, whatever. If you want to learn more about it, good luck reading the Fourier transfer page on Wikipedia. <laughs> and then you create, through the context, you create this wave, passing these two arrays. And basically then you can just say, um, oscillator uh, set periodic wave of this wave. Yeah. And if the demo gods are with me, <laughs> Pretty good, eh? Um, it's enough. Um, if you want to play it in your free time, I've uh, like I've released this like with way more ringtones. So to conclude the talk, I don't. I, I, how much time do I have? Time for two? Yes. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> so which one do you want? The good, the bad, the ugly. Barbie Girl, The Simpsons, Harry Potter, Indiana Jones, Mission Impossible, My Heart Will Go, uh, just to make you listen to Grand Vals. And I've added the ability to, to loop it, so if you can, if you want it, <laughs> can someone please, like, pick up the phone? <laughs> and the last thing I want to do, which I'm going to close the talk with, is this big surprise. So, yeah, that's the end. <laughs> Recrawled by Nokia 3310 emulator. <laughs> oh, no, no, stop. Sorry, still thing. So, if you want to like get like the materials, uh, they're there. Everything is included, also the transcript of the talk, and that's the code, and you can play around with it if you want to. Thank you. Great, thank you for this great talk. Um, do you have questions? I oh, think we have we had time for questions? Yes, okay. we have time for Beautiful. questions. Beautiful, let's go questions. Oh. Uh, it, works on, it works on phones. I had to fix it on iOS because they are stupid and they require you to use WebKit audio context still, but it's fine. I fixed it for them. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so my question is, um, is there any way to talk to the Web Audio API from within Elm? There is. There's this library which is called Elm Web Audio API, and it's made by this um, person in London, actually. So it was part of my plan to 
uh, describe this audio graph in Elm. And in the end, you will still send the data over through a port. But the nice part is like you don't have to write this really awkward code in JavaScript. You can write in Elm, and it will send the right stuff through the port. Like if you think about it, it makes sense. But I haven't done it. But there is, if you look for, I think his username on GitHub is PD Andy, and the, the, the library is called Elm Web Audio. So it is definitely possible. Like if you don't want to get your hands too dirty. Um, any more questions? We're not leaving, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, see? Very silly question. When you made the typo on the right to remove the edge, then uh -huh. you suggested, or oh, maybe you mean string. Uh -huh. So why is that? I think it's just trying to do like a humming distance of the of the defined variables. Yeah, but the humming distance of duration length of string are still a bit. Yeah, they're different. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would, would would have like to check the source. Usually, when I look at that, like the first match is the right one. So my brain has just learned to ignore the rest. But I would have to, you know, it's like we're programmers, so like we're very good at like pattern matching. Um, I don't know why it was showing string. I'm not sure if it's. I don't think he was thinking it was a string. So maybe it's just like there are not enough variables. So it's just like trying its best and saying, okay, the closest. You know, maybe the match, the humming algorithm was saying this match of this thing is 0, 34, but it was better than the rest. So it just like printed it out. I think like in a big code base, it usually never does that because you have, you know, more matches. You know, like when you look for user, there's like at least 10 matches in your code base that match with the user. So if I had to guess, it would be that. Otherwise, I don't know, it's Evan's fault. I've never you know, <laughs> contributed any line of code to Elm, so I just write it. Um, OK, yeah. then, I think, if you have other questions, you can come to them yeah. afterwards. OK, thank you again.